If you're looking for a book to really intrigue your children, I've got one for you here. It's called Al Capone Does My Shirts. It takes place on the island of Alcatraz. This is a really fantastic book. It won the Newbery Honor Award, and I'm about to sit down with the author, Jennifer Childinko. She wrote this and many others. That's coming up next on Books Alive. Thank you so much for joining us today on Books Alive. I have a real treat for you today. We are joined with the very wonderful Jennifer Choldinko. Welcome. Welcome. It's just great to have you here. It really is. Now, for those of you who have been to Alcatraz and for those of you who have not, this lady takes you on a trip there in a couple of her books, Al Capone Does My Shirts, and then she went on to do his shoes. Um, this won a Newbery Honor, and we're going to be taking a look at these books, but she didn't start right here. She, you know, began at the beginning, and that was a few years back. So we're going to do a little exploring, and you're in for a real treat. All right, Jennifer, the first book that you ever published was Moonstruck, and it's the true story of the cow who jumped over the moon. Okay, how do you start with, with a nursery rhyme? Was this your favorite nursery rhyme or? Well, actually, I was taking a class at the time at uh, Rhode Island School of Design uh -huh. in writing and illustrating picture books, and I was having a terrible time. I was coming up with all these stories, and my teacher, I was blessed to have the best teacher on earth, David McCauley. Oh my gosh. And he, he didn't really like the story ideas and f after a while he'd say, well, you know, just illustrate an existing story. Don't oh. be writing your own stories. What a great idea. And uh, so then I got started thinking about the nursery rhymes. I was kind of depressed because I knew I oh. wanted to write. Yes. And so I, and the line of the cow that jumped over the moon is my favorite nursery rhyme line ever. Why? Uh, well, because I, I used to ride horses and um, the idea of jumping the moon just seemed really <laughs> possible to me. Oh, that's great. And so because I felt like everybody in the class was doing so well and I wasn't, oh. I somehow thought, well, I'm like, I'm like the cow and there are all these horses that jump over the moon naturally because yeah. they're good at it. They're yeah. built for it. Yeah. And I'm not. Oh my. And so all of a sudden the story just popped out. Oh, how cool. And I uh, started illustrating it and uh, that was my project. And this, David McCauley loved it. Did he? <laughs> oh, that was the best yes. part. So here's the cow as she jumps the wall. Right. Before the moon thing, we had to do the wall. Well, you have to have training. I mean, you can't just jump the moon, you know, without having Amen. built up towards it. Yes. And I love, there's a little picture in here where the sheep gives the cow a 6.8 for, for a leap. It was absolutely, oh, there she goes, there <laughs> she goes. Okay, so this is really a story about believing in yourself? Absolutely. Did you have somebody who believed in you? Yeah, I think the person that believed in me the most, and especially about my writing life, was my father. Wow. He loved to write. It wasn't his profession, but he used to come home from work every night uh -huh. and um, put on his slippers and his comfortable sh uh, shirt mm -hmm. and he would sit behind this big Underwood typewriter and start writing. Wow. And he didn't say like writing is so much fun or he, n no pep talk like that, yeah. but what you do at the end of a hard day is something that you love to do. Yes. And I think that taught me a lot. He also loved books. Uh, he would read a, at least a book a night and he had we had books everywhere. Mm. And so I think that, uh, and, and any time I wrote, uh, he loved it. He just thought it was the best thing in the world and it would be published. And so that was really wonderful. Yeah, he filled you with that sense that you can do it. Yes. But you started out in advertising, right? Well, uh, I'd always wanted to write and I actually graduated with a degree in creative writing. It was English and creative writing. 
And, but then, you know, it's kind of scary to try and think of making a living writing books. And I knew I had to make a living. So I kind of fumbled around for a while and then I decided, well, I'll get a, a job where I at least can write. Maybe it's not writing what I want to do, but at least I'll get to string words together, which is what I really <laughs> love to do. So that's how I started out. Uh, and what kind of advertising did you do? I'm just curious. <laughs> it's, well, it's kind of embarrassing. It's uh -oh. kind of the... <laughs> <laughs> it's the, uh, uh, the if there's an ugly stepchild of advertising, that's what I did. Um, oh. uh, junk mail. I was junk the junk mail, mail queen. Yes. Wow. <laughs> okay. Now this has got to give people hope. Yeah. And absolutely. your dreams can come true because if she can start there, and then she can get the phone call that she won the Newberry Honor. You know, no worries here, folks. <laughs> Okay, so you came to a point where you said this advertising thing is just not working for me. Well, it worked for a while because it gave me a lot of things like it, discipline. Oh. You know, I had to write eight hours a day, mm -hmm. and writing is a muscle, and you have to build the muscles ah. to be able to do that. And so I had to learn to do that, mm -hmm. to make deadlines, to do a lot of revision, to come up with a lot of brainstorming ideas mm -hmm. really quickly. Mm -hmm. All of that was very useful, but after a while, I had to move on beyond that. Mm -hmm. and. I, I began to really hate doing it. Ah. And I would have to, the, the deadlines, uh, deadlines are not a big thing for me now because mm -hmm. I love doing what I'm doing, so mm -hmm. I don't need a deadline in order to do it. But towards the end of advertising, I really needed deadlines because I really hated doing it. And I began to realize that I would rather be a failure at something I wanted to do than Ooh. a success at something I hated. Oh, and wow. And so I had to really just step out. I just couldn't yeah. do it anymore. You know, we had T.A. Barron here a couple years ago, and he said the same thing. He was in New York, and he was president of some company, and he went to a shareholders meeting, and he shocked them all by saying, I am walking away from this probably million-dollar job, and I'm going out to Colorado, and I'm going to do what I love because I can't live my life and not have done that. Right. What a huge message, message that is. Okay, so you jumped into writing. You did Moonstruck, and I know this isn't in order, but... Now we have Louder Lily, mm -hmm. and your character is this little girl who just really can't speak up until, until the horrible, what was her name, Cassidy? Cassidy. Cassidy. Okay, so where did this idea come from for you? Well, there's always a starting idea that gets things in motion. Mm -hmm. the, the books don't come to me completely formed. Okay. So the first idea is really important because that sets the dominoes going. And the first huh. idea actually came uh, from my kids. Uh, I, my son had, I, they were both at this camp and I didn't do enough research about the camp and it really only had younger kids and my son was too old oh. for it. And so there was this young kid that was following him around and he loved <sighs> to build these great Lego creations and uh, she would like mess with them and take oh. them apart. And, oh. and so I said to her, um, my daughter at that point was about four and we were driving home. So I said to Ian, well, did you tell her, Ian, to stop it? Did you tell her? And he said, yeah, I told her. And then Kai, who at four just belts out really loudly, well, tell her again, Ian, <laughs> only louder. Oh, that's fantastic. So that was kind of, that, that volume thing was in yeah. my mind. and. I went through a stage, actually, when I was older than that, where I got very shy, and so ah. I kind of put that all together, and yeah. somehow out came Louder Lily. Well, here she is when she finally decides to do take Kai's advice and yell, stop it. But before that, she's, she doesn't even speak up loud enough for her teacher to know she's present in the classroom, much less anything else. But then she starts watching Cassidy, who we're not such a big fan of, cut all the hair off the guinea pig and play with the glue and stuff. Mm -hmm. So what do you think of this Cassidy character? I'm going to ask you about all these sort of background <laughs> characters. <laughs> Where would that one come from? Well, Cassidy has no social skills. Ah. And so she uses brute force because she doesn't really know how to make friends. Ah. And uh, she hasn't learned. I mean, you know, in second grade, it takes a while to learn all of that. Uh, the refining skills. Yeah. I, I don't think she's necessarily that mean so much as uh -huh. she just doesn't think. 
and she has to learn to stop and think about things. Mm -hmm. um, some of my other characters are a little meaner than Cassie. I think Cassie's <laughs> yes. just clueless, okay. really clueless. Okay. And so she found this one way that gets what she wants, ah. and so she does it. Yes. And so she just needs to kind of learn, oh, that's that. you're not supposed to do things uh -huh. that way. Okay. That's great. Well, I mean, the first one, you teach children to believe in themselves. The second one, you help them find their voice. The third one, let me reach over and grab this. This is How to Make Friends with a Giant. And this, I thought the name choices were interesting. You've got Jake and is it Giacomo? Giacomo. Giacomo. Okay, so they're close, close, mm -hmm. very close mm -hmm. in sound. One guy is super short. That would be Jake. The other guy is huge, and that would be Giacomo. Now, they're first graders, and they're going to find themselves hopping on the bus together. How different can they be? And they both kind of don't fit in, shall we say, mm -hmm. one being too short, one being too tall. So where did this one come from? Well, I think actually this one came from my kids, too. Uh, oh. uh, my son was very short for a while. He isn't anymore, but uh -huh. he was really short. And I volunteered at his kindergarten, and there, a fireman came and uh, was giving this demonstration. I knew it was something he really wanted to do, but again, he couldn't somehow raise his hand and make eye contact and he was so little he just got lost oh. and so I thought well what he needs is a friend who's a giant oh, wow. that will help him yeah. you know be more visible oh here they are I mean these guys really learn how to sort of um, make room for each other you know like figuring out that well they swap sandwiches at one point and and his sandwich is huge and so then they say well friends swap back and so they swap the sandwich back. Oh, and he dangles the teacher, and she makes a new rule, no, no teacher dangling. <laughs> <laughs> That's really cute. But his feelings are so hurt. And, you know, your heart just goes out to him. It truly does. So I loved your last line. And one thing I learned about you is that your, fin your, your finishes are pretty big finishes. <laughs> I work really hard on the ends. You know, I think it's really important. I feel like if someone has gone through a book with me, I want to make sure that the end fulfills them. Because that's what you're left with after you close the book. You're left with that end. And yeah. so it has to be something that makes you think. That, that is my, my big goal. I want, I want it to be something. I don't want to do junk mail, junk mail books. Yes. I don't want to do junk food books. Yes. I want to do books that you stay with you, that you will th remember parts of years later. Okay. Yeah, I was going to ask you about what a junk food book is. So that would be something that you can just read and walk away from and, and not have learned or felt or had some change maybe? Well, all books are good and so I, I never yeah. want to discourage any, anybody from reading and whatever yeah. you want to read is fine. Right. I just, my personal goal is to have books that stay with you a little longer. Okay. So when you write, that's what you're doing. Mm -hmm. That's a gift. All right, and in this one, her big finale is, we walk home together, we are best friends now. This was a good day. I have never felt so tall. And I just read that like Mem Fox taught me to read, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Yay, Mem! Go, Mem! <laughs> All right, that is a great, great, fantastic finale. Okay, so let's jump into some of your juvenile fiction here. She wrote Notes from a Liar and Her Dog. Okay, and this came right after Moonstruck. Yeah, that's my second book. All right. So this is a family. Let me just set it up for you. Um, there's Aunt, who's my favorite character. She's got two sisters who are like the highnesses, Elizabeth and Catherine. The, they move a lot. They mm -hmm. move a lot. These kids, just, they just get settled in, and dang it, Dad has got something wrong with the job, and they're going to go move somewhere else. And Aunt is not a truster. She doesn't trust much of anything. And this is really a story about her and her dealing with her sisters and her family. And you, you found this character. How, where did you find this character? Well, the thing that was interesting about that book is that I, a lot of people think your first novel is, is really autobiographical and mm -hmm. there's a lot of wink, wink, nod, nod, that's really what it was about <laughs> and everybody kind of knows that. This is probably my least autobiographical book, Okay. even though it's my first novel. It was my yeah. first published novel, I should say. Okay, <laughs> there were okay. a few more that, <laughs> before that. But, <laughs> um, but 
this came from in the middle of the night I woke up and I started writing in the voice of aunt and as I said I don't know where she came from you know I was not the middle child I was you know if anything too honest in fact I am too frank in that that's kind of a problem for me in my life. <laughs> I'll just tell you and I when I really shouldn't you know uh, so but she had so much force I think in some ways she's like the opposite of the way I was when I was a kid and so maybe the part of me that I totally pushed down just shot up I wow. don't know wow. I don't know my my sisters uh, were not like that at all and I also had a brother he wasn't like that my parents weren't like that not sure where she came from hmm. well she is so mistrustful of her family that she never reveals herself and she even has a best friend named Harrison and they have exchanged the report cards so she who gets all A's is bringing home his report card which is not quite so bright and shiny and her parents never question this they never ask mm -hmm. and I thought um, and she does a whole lot of that because she's really she wants to be seen so much but she wants them to do the work to see her she's not going to hand it to them and um, I thought her father comes home from a trip I think it was to San Antonio and the sisters have got the ballet show all planned and you know the perfect family is, has arrived and aunt is sitting in her room you had her wait 11 minutes and 33 seconds timing how long till this man goes where is she and then he comes up to her mm -hmm. and walks away saying she doesn't need anybody does she how poignant yeah how poignant well I hope the book is funny but it's sh but the character yeah. is very angry yeah and so she does these things because she's really mad and it comes out this way and there's a, a history to this and so she's been doing this for a while and they are tired of it and so it has built to this point well she is she is funny and she has her little dog she keeps them in her pocket mm -hmm. <laughs> and he does all kinds of things including facing off with the lions at the zoo mm -hmm. <laughs> that was wow. fun because I volunteered at the zoo for a year oh, to wow. research that because I wanted oh, those gosh. scenes to be real yeah and it really made a difference because at first the plot ideas I had I saw as soon as I started working at the zoo they weren't gonna work and so that was really really helpful and I could get the the details so that you could feel like the setting and feel that you Definitely. were there and that yeah. really makes a difference for me and you brought in the character of just Carol who's her teacher and you have such hope for that teacher <laughs> you really do but I was curious if you when you wrote her did you try to give her limits as far as how much she would intrude in the family or how did you figure out how, to, how far to go with her? Well, she's a new teacher, so I felt like she was probably going to be willing to stick her neck out more than maybe a teacher that ha had had a lot of experience might. And she was very idealistic. And I just, and I had a teacher who really was instrumental during my actually high school years and, and really bonded with me and helped me a lot and so I kind of used a little bit of that teacher ah. in Just Carol too. Okay. Speaking of teachers it just went through my mind. I know I read that you had had David McCauley. You also had Chris Van Allsburg. Yes. What I mean these are incredible illustrators of our time or of any time. What did you get from them? What did you personally get from them? Well, I, after I took that one class with David McCauley, I took several independent studies with him because I just love him. He has such an amazing mind. He is so funny and the way he looks at things, it's so different than anybody else. And I just loved spending time with him and showing him my ideas and he'd go, oh, you could do it this way. And then I would go, oh, you could do it that way. And it was just so fun. Yeah. And at the end of all of those independent studies, he said to me, you know, I don't know about your illustrations, but you have good ideas. Wow. And I see a lot of kids, and you're, you have really, this is unusual. And oh that made such gosh. a difference to me yes. because, of course, it's very difficult. I, I didn't have trouble getting that first book published, but I had a terrible time getting the second book published. Oh. I wrote about 53 second books before wow. I got to Notes from a Liar and a Dog. And during that period, I held on to that. You know, yes. he thought I had good ideas. Yes. 
And so that made a really big difference to me. And he used to talk to me about things like that were so out of my league. I couldn't understand why he would be discussing them with me, yeah. but it gave me hope that he would. Things like, um, well, you know, you shouldn't just follow the money. You should stay with an editor who's good. And I'm like, what? <laughs> what are you telling me these things for? Yeah. But yeah. somehow that helped too. That he he somehow thought I was going to be a professional. You were going to make this. it. I was going to make it. To know. Yeah. Yes. Now speaking of the editor. You did have to stay with an editor, didn't you, for the Al Capone books? Yes. Uh, I've had the same editor for all my novels, ah. and she moved houses, so I moved with her for mm -hmm. If a Tree Falls at Lunch Period, and then she moved back, and I moved back with her, because I do believe that there, there's a real partnership, that an editor is a very instrumental part of the process, mm -hmm. and so it's not something that I think anybody can do it mm -hmm. and it you know not only do you have to be a good editor but there has to be a, again a good collaboration mm -hmm. there has to be a good synergy between mm -hmm. you and I had that with Kathy Dawson so I did, stayed did with you it. feel like she understood you or was she more like your David McCauley who saw your goodness and stretched you she always asked the right questions Wow and that's really important okay. and she also trusts if I don't, most of the time I really agree with what she has to say. Mm -hmm. Maybe not right away when I get the editorial letter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I might, I, in fact, I have this rule I never talk to her for a few weeks afterwards until oh. I kind of let it, let it settle a little. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because sometimes she's ahead of me. Uh, and so I get to that idea a little bit later, and so I don't uh, want to say, I'm not doing that. Yeah, you know? yeah, 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 yeah. You let it simmer a little bit. I do. Okay. Well, do you get the middle of the night things still? Absolutely. In fact, uh, when I was revising uh, No Passengers Beyond This Point, mm -hmm. she had come up with this idea that I totally agreed with her, that the middle needed more tension, and mm -hmm. I didn't know how I was going to do that. Mm -hmm. And that book is very much, we'll talk about it later, but it's mm -hmm. very much about travel mm -hmm. and airplanes. And all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, I woke up with this image of the white courtesy phone. Oh, You cool. know, at airports, they sometimes yes. say, you know, well, Barb Langridge, please yes. come to the white courtesy phone. Yes. The yes. white courtesy phone. And that always seemed like the voice of Oz. Yes. <laughs> yes. And who <laughs> right, is it right. that right. they're calling? And who right. is on the other end of the phone? And what is that communication like? And somehow, yeah. That image helped me strengthen the center of the wow. book. So middle wow. of the night ideas are really All valuable. The sometimes they're wacky, yeah. but I yeah. try and write them down yeah. so that, because sometimes they really are val valuable. Wow. The, the phone thing, when they make that announcement, to me there's always an implied story. You know, as soon as they make that name announcement, something's going through my head going, what happened? Where are they going? You know, what's the what's the crisis? You know, what what's going on? They're probably just you know your your luggage tag is you know at the concession right. stand or something. But it but, seems so know, important. It truly does. Yeah, it truly does. Beyond our normal everyday life, somehow. Right. You know? You're being called out of your life for this. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Wow. Have you ever been called out of your life? I'm just. Mm, well, I think. Certainly, when they called to tell me I won the Newbery Honor, that oh. was called out of my life. Yes. Because I have, I'm not the winning kind of person. <laughs> <laughs> I, as, okay. I'm not, I'm not. I mean, I used to ride horses, but I never, you know, I, I, what, I was just not a winner. And the best award I got as a kid was the, be the Good Sportsmanship Award. Wow. Which is the award they give for kids who are not really good at anything. Oh. So are you being a good sports? I'm getting a, I, a little bit. A little bit, okay. Yeah, but okay. not, not, you it's know, not, not driving overly, you. Yeah, it's not yeah. driving yeah. me. Yeah. Uh, wow. So, so, that, that. so, so it was sort of like I couldn't believe it because this was so yeah. not my life yeah. that I just, I didn't understand how this could happen to wow. me. Wow. Wow. Well, that's the perfect place. We're going to stop and take a short break. But when we come back, we are going to pick up with Al Capone Does My Shirts. And this is the book that she got that wonderful phone call for. So, Stay with us, we'll be right back. When someone abducts a child, they're not about to advertise it, but we will. Sign up at wirelessamberalerts.org to get free Amber Alert text messages on your cell phone. 
help put a child abductor out of business for good. Wireless Amber Alerts. A child is calling for help. Did you find the flashlight and the batteries? Yes. Did you make sure we're not missing anything in the first aid kit? Yep. Did you go through the plan with the kids again? Yes. The more you prepare today, the more you'll be able to reduce the devastating effects of a tornado, an earthquake, a power outage, or any other disaster. Get a kit, make a plan, be informed. Visit ready.gov. Cotton balls. Duct tape. Spoon. Needle. Thread. Scalpel. The smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. Thanks so much for coming back with us. And as I told you right before we left, we're about to talk to Miss Jennifer Choldingo about Al Capone Does My Shirts. Okay. Al Capone. Is this like a hero of yours? <laughs> 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 who I want to be when I grow up, or, you know, no. where on earth did that come from? <laughs> well, actually, uh, I got the idea for Al Capone Does My Shirts before Notes from a Lion or Dog sold, so I was in that seven-year period where I was writing books after book after book, and yes. they weren't getting published. I saw an article in the San Francisco Chronicle about kids who lived on Alcatraz when there was a working penitentiary there. Mm. And as soon as I saw that article, yeah. I thought, okay, that's me. Wow. I want to be that person. Wow. And the, the way I get to be someone other than myself is yeah. to write a book about that kid. That's one of the reasons that I like to... Why would you want to be that person? Well, I just thought it would be so much fun to be growing up on an island with all these bad guys locked up up top. Wow. I mean, what an experience that would be. Yeah. And uh, I, the, there was a working penitentiary on Alcatraz for 29 years, so I had to try and figure out when during that time I wanted to set it. Mm -hmm. And I love the bridges, so uh, I wanted to set it when the bridges were being built because I oh. thought it would be so much fun to imagine um, the Golden Gate Bridge being built yes. and the Bay Bridge being built. Yes. And I also wanted to set it when one of the infamous bad guys were there, so I started looking at all the notorious bad guys trying to figure out which one I wanted to use. Yeah. So that's how I didn't like start out with Al Capone. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, I started okay. out looking at Machine Gun Kelly yeah. and Alvin Creepy Carpus and Ooh, Martin Sobel yeah. and all of these people until I decided that Al Capone, believe it or not, even though he is definitely a bad guy, yeah. he was one of the nicer of the bad guys. Hmm. Um, some of them were really odd, like the Ooh. Birdman, oh, scumbag. Ooh. Ooh. Is that the one they did the movie about? Yes, really? but the movie gave him this big PR as if yeah. he was a wonderful person. He yeah. was awful. Oh. And not that Al's good, he's not. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, but he had a nice side, and a uh -huh. small nice side, so I thought he would make a more interesting character, because if characters are all dark, they, they're not as interesting. Ah, oh, that's really interesting. Okay. All right, so are you a risk taker then? if you would want to live on that island with those locked up bad guys? Because I In can tell you right now, <laughs> I would not want to do that. <laughs> Well, in my fantasy life, I take sure. all the risks. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So maybe, maybe not. Okay. So to give you guys a, a sense of what's going on here, it's 1935, and Moose and his family, and that means his mom, dad, and his sister, Nat, Natalie, have moved to Alcatraz. <clears throat> it is, I guess, the Depression. Mm -hmm. And it's a time when jobs are scarce. And Dad has gotten a job now. He's going to be the, an electrician on the island for you know, working for the prison as, or, or the penitentiary. Mm -hmm. And he's also going to be a guard. So um, the family has a problem, though, because Natalie, the sister, she has what we would now call autism. And in that time frame, they didn't have a name for this. They had no idea what was going on. So the family's struggling with that. And, um, and I know I've read a million interviews that you've done before, and so I know you're comfortable talking about mm -hmm. it, this, what, how this played a part in your own life. Mm -hmm. So what was that like for you? 
Well, I, uh, I wasn't, I know I look old, but I wasn't alive in 1935. <laughs> um, but You don't look old. <laughs> but I did have, the sister closest to me in age had autism. And it was uh, still the dark ages. Autism had been identified by then, but they didn't really know much about it. And they still don't know nearly enough, but they know a lot more now than they did then. And so we were struggling with some of the same issues that uh, a, a Moose and his family had to struggle with, like finding a place for her. Uh, m one of the issues that Moose has is that there are tend to be a, a greater percentage of boys than girls with autism and so it was hard that made it even more difficult to find a place for my sister Gina mm. so I use a lot of those feelings mm -hmm. when I was a kid there were no books about kids with autism mm -hmm. it's much less siblings with autism but I decided I hadn't originally thought I would write I, I knew someday I would write about that mm -hmm. but I didn't think it would be this book mm -hmm. But what happened was, every time I would go to the island, because I volunteered to work on the island as a docent, and I would go there one day a, a week, and every time I would go there, I would find myself thinking of my sister with autism, and I didn't really know why that was, but I, as a writer, I trust my instincts. Ah. And so I thought, well, if, I keep, if she keeps popping into my head, then maybe I'll put a character with autism in this book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I read that you said, go with the feeling of the story. Don't try to like think your way through it, something like that. Is that pretty much how you work, how you operate? Yeah, I think the quote is from Nora Fox Mazur, and she says to feel your way through a storyline, not okay. think your way through the storyline. Okay. And that is the best ah, quote I've ever had because right. thinking my way gets the book very stiff. Mm. And feeling my way allows mm -hmm. the characters to start to come to life and just to make some d different decisions than I had planned. Mm. And once I let go of the book and the characters take over, it's a really, it's <laughs> always a positive I can't occurrence. even imagine what that must feel like when you let go and let the characters take over. And I hear author after author say that. But what is that, what is that like? Well, they start being real, the characters. You know, the, the beginning is when you start, you come up with a name for them, and you think, I'm not sure that's the right name, but then they start coming to life, and you realize you can't change their name anymore because mm. that's their name mm -hmm. any more than I could change my name because mm -hmm. that's my name. Mm -hmm. and so that's, that's the beginning of starting to make progress. But they, they seem really real. I mean, my, my husband, one of the reasons that I don't, do a lot of illustration is I get very lonely when I illustrate. Mm. I never get lonely when I write. Oh, because you always have the company the of characters the characters. The characters are so real to me mm, that wow. I, I, I'm spending time with them. With them, wow. And in this book, okay, part of the problem is that when they first send Natalie off to the school that they have it all arranged for her to go to, she doesn't last 36 hours and they have to bring her back. Now she's on the island and Moose is gonna have to be, you know, the big brother, oh my gosh, the little sister. He's trying to find himself, create a life for himself. He loves baseball, that kind of thing. And you bring in quite a cast of characters there with Teresa, Annie, Piper, oh my gosh, Jimmy. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to think if there was anybody else. But um, that's quite a balance that you gave us. Now, where, describe Teresa. Why did you want her in there? What, what are you doing with her? Because she's really glue. Well, first, I have to say that I, one of the early challenges with the book is that I felt like it was two books. There was Moose and his family, and then there was the Moose and the kids on the island. And I was having trouble weaving it together mm -hmm. until I realized that, like all of us, Moose had a different personality out in the world with his friends and he uh -huh. did at home. Uh -huh. So that helped me weave it together. But the character Teresa actually was, again, completely unplanned. I had Jimmy on the island because I knew there needed to be another boy. So Jimmy came to life and then all of a sudden I'm writing about Jimmy and Teresa pops up. <laughs> So she, she was fun because she, she came out of nowhere and she had, ah. she came fully formed. Wow. Sometimes that doesn't always happen. So you yeah. always, it's a gift when a character comes fully formed like wow. Teresa did. I love listening to you describe this. It's just so cool. It's like birthing something in your brain, <laughs> you know, that's really awesome. Okay, I am, we're, well, you need to know that the family is really having a difficult time getting Natalie, <clears throat> excuse me, into that school. And so... 
her big brother Moose turns to the powerful person in his world beyond his parents, and that is Al Capone. Well, first he turns to the warden. Yes. He turns to the warden. So he tries a lot of things to get help. And again, this, this follows a, a plot line in my own life because we did have such a hard time finding a place for my sister. And the Esther P. Marinoff School, which is a made-up name, I did research to find that there were special schools in 1935. There was one in San Francisco called the Sunshine School. But the name came from a name of a school that we tried to get my sister in, which was the Dubinoff School. So oh. I, I played <laughs> off yeah, that right. because then it would be real to me. <laughs> um, um, so now I've lost my train of thought about what the question you just asked me was. <laughs> oh, I was talking about how Moose turned to the powerful oh. Al Capone. Well, you know, Moose was pretty much wanted to do the right thing. And so for him to do something that wasn't the right thing was really hard for him and he, something that he really had to think think good and long about. So yes, he did try and, and get help wherever he could because in the end he really did love M Natalie. And uh, I modeled him a little bit after my brother who had a very close relationship with my sister with autism. And they just had a, a, an amazing bond. And so I, I, hmm. I borrowed a little from mm -hmm. them. Teresa does too. I mean, she has such an innate understanding of you know, playing the different games with her, the country game, you know, or, you know, mm -hmm. you say a country and I'll draw it, and, you know, her bingo game and everything. I mean, that was really, really cool and so reassuring. Okay, so you get the phone call. Let's talk a little bit about the phone <laughs> call, because where were you? Did you know that they would be calling people then? Did you have, was that on your radar at all? Well, there's all these mock Newberries that go on, and yes. so I'd, I've been getting emails from people, oh, you know, your book won the mock Newberry. I knew it didn't really mean anything to win the mock Newberry, uh -huh. but it, it was getting me kind of excited. Ah. And, but again, I am not a winner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like, if it had been someone else, it would have probably would have been really excited. And I knew, because I live on the, on the West Coast, and at the ALA was, I think it was in Boston that year, mm -hmm. um, I had heard that they called really early because they had to call before the announcement in, in Boston yeah. and with the time zone changes. Holy cow. And so I, the phone rang, and I heard it, and I thought, wow, you know, your fantasy life is really <laughs> out of control. <laughs> You're even hearing the phone ring. Oh, my God. You're losing it. And, you know. How so then great. the phone stopped ringing, and I'm yeah. thinking, that really was the phone ringing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't answer it. <laughs> you idiot. <laughs> <laughs> so the phone started ringing again, and we, our phone was a long way from, it wasn't near our, our room. And so anyway, my husband got it. And my husband, you know, it thinks there's it's something strange that you, uh, we're getting this four in the morning phone call. Yeah. So he screens it very carefully. Oh. <laughs> Good man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Who is it? Yeah. Why do you want to speak to her? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> and I would like to say that I had a lot of profound things to say, but uh, all I could say is, oh my God, oh, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Best answer. That's so great. Congratulations all Thank over you. again. Thank That's you. such an achievement. Oh my, and especially coming from when you thought everybody in the class could do it and you couldn't do it. And oh my goodness. All right, so how great is that? And now she, you're going to make this a trilogy, correct? That's right. Okay, so she, after she wrote the first one, Al Capone Does My Shirts, she wrote Al Capone Shines in My Shoes. And in this one, all of a sudden the tables turn a little bit on Moose because it looks like he gets a message to his laundry where Al Capone is now calling in his chips and he wants a little payback for something he did in book one. Let me give you a little background here. Uh, this phrase, Al Capone does my shirts, actually comes from real life because Al Capone's first job on Alcatraz was in the laundry and the laundry did do the laundry for the kids who lived on the island. And there was an exchange that went on through the laundry. Uh, if there was a hated guard, then oh. their clothes would come back mangled in some way, uh -huh. you know, extra starch, some, something uh -huh. subtle like that, uh -huh. or missing buttons or uh -huh. cuffs sewn together. Uh -huh. And so the really hated guards did not send their laundry through. Wow. And so that gave me some ideas that there would be a way of communicating via the laundry. How wonderful. You must have researched the heck out of this. 
Yeah, I'm a, a member of the Alcatraz Alumni Association. Oh, wow. Which meets every year uh -huh. on Alcatraz. Uh -huh. And it's it, people that were incarcerated on the island, people who were guards on the island, people who grew up on the island. It's like a big picnic. Wow. And uh, I've gotten to know a lot of these people. The, the old president of the Alumni Association mm -hmm. has an archive in his living room Ooh. that is unbelievable. He's retired and has spent the last 15 years uh, compiling amazing kinds of information. Mm. Uh, so I, I've networked with a lot of people and yeah. heard stories from guards. I mean, to, to hear, to get to ask questions of an actual person who mm -hmm. was there, mm -hmm. you know, was amazing. Because oh, yeah. sometimes you couldn't, there would be little gaps mm -hmm. and you say, well, how did this work? And mm -hmm. then I could go, like, for example, there were past men in the warden's house, mm -hmm. the, the cook and the houseboy were convicts. And how did it work? Because the count bell would go off every hour. How did it work for them to get counted? Mm -hmm. So I couldn't find that anywhere. Mm -hmm. So I asked one of the guards. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, what happened was they would come out to the front porch. And then people would come around from the front of the cell house. Mm -hmm. And they would count them. And then they could go back in. Every so 30 things like minutes, that. Right? Yeah. 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 I read your note. That is amazing. I can't imagine knowing all that. When you walked on the island, did you feel ghosts? <laughs> Kids ask me that all the time. I'll Are there ghosts on Alcatraz? Yeah. There's actually a book about the ghosts on Alcatraz. Yeah. No, but I have to tell you, at night, it is spooky there. It feels really spooky. There's a night tour that you can go on. Ooh. And uh, just when I was working there, at the end of the day, uh, during the winter, the, the last boat is at 4.30. And so you have to get everybody off the island. And then the night watchman comes, and there's this exchange. Mm -hmm. And that always seems strange because mm. you're leaving this guy on this yeah. spooky island. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Unprotected. Oh, no. <laughs> All right. Well, in this one... Our friend Moose, everybody changed in this one, I felt like. All the characters evolved a little bit. Mm -hmm. And Moose has an interesting relationship with the warden's daughter, Piper, mm -hmm. who you describe as someone who loves to play with fire. Mm -hmm. So um, how, I guess, I guess I, I couldn't be sure if they really liked each other in that first book. Were you sure at that point? Well, I think that in some ways they are attracted to each other because uh, Piper is, she does what she wants and Moose never does. Mm. I mean, he, he tries to do the right thing mm -hmm. and she's willing to just play with fire. She's willing to go to the edge. Mm -hmm. And and I think there can be an attraction between those because they are both seeking a balance in some ways. Mm. And so there was a real, I mm -hmm. think, attraction between them. But Moose also doesn't really like her because he doesn't like the way she behaves. Right. And so it's an uncomfortable kind of attraction. Yeah. And you were talking about Moose and how he always wants to do the right thing. And that really plays heavily in this one because he's sort of trying to be nice to everybody. Right. And in doing so, isn't perhaps as authentic as people want to need him to be. Right. So he's kind of can't win. <laughs> right. Know? But I think that's a hard, in life, I've, I've struggled with that. When you try and really be nice, you you're trying to be nice to everyone, but yes. at a certain point, are you being authentic? Right. And are, is that fair? And will you, people trust you if you're not authentic? And mm -hmm. trying to find that balance is I think something many people struggle with. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, Piper, the warden's daughter, is going to have her world shift a little bit in this book because her mother is expecting a baby and the dad is hoping it's going to be a boy. And at the same time, um, J. Edgar Hoover is planning to show up and everybody is polishing the streets literally with their toothbrushes and everything to make everything look good. There's a fantastic scene in here where they go to dinner. Did you draw that from anything that you found in your research, or did you just dream it up? Well, I read a lot about J. Edgar Hoover, because he's a very interesting character, mm -hmm. and trying to understand how he might behave in this circumstance. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I did mostly make it up, but I, the setting is real. Pretty much. I mean, that's where the dinners would be held, and so I tr I tried to, I, I played a, a I, I took a few liberties with mm -hmm. it, but generally, uh, generally it, it's a it's a made up scene. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> with some spit yeah, and the mashed yeah, potatoes. Right, 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 right. <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> that was fun. Okay, so she's gonna do one more of those 
and that'll that's be really on my fun. editor's desk now. Is it? Yes. Oh, that's so exciting. I'm just waiting for an editorial letter from uh, her uh, on that. And then you'll have the pause, and then you'll go on. Oh, that's great. Okay, I love this book. If a tree falls at lunch period, and you know, kids come back to school after that long summer, and they, especially middle school, and they can't wait to be back with their friends because that's where their real life is. And our friend Kirsten here has been waiting to see Rory forever and ever and ever because they haven't been together. But Rory has done that middle school girl thing and has changed big time on her. So, um, oh my gosh, I mean, my heart broke for her. But Brianna is the queen bee that's going to lure Rory off. And can you give us a sense of who you think Brianna is? What kind of girl is that girl that we keep meeting over and over again? Well, I did research on this book. I, I was, this book was harder to research. It, uh, sometimes books, I'm always looking to figure out how to feed my book. And mm. some books are easier to feed than others. Mm -hmm. And this one was harder to feed. Mm. But I went to the, uh, the local middle school Mill Valley Middle School, and I sat in the library. I talked to the library, and she let me hang out in the library. Yeah. And uh, they were having this audition for a talent show, and there was this girl that walked by to the audition, uh -huh. and she was singing, and she was dancing on oh. the way. And I thought, she knows she's going to make it. Yeah. She's, she, there's no doubt in this girl's mind mm -hmm. that she is going to make it to the talent show, that the audition is not a big issue for mm -hmm, her. Mm -hmm. And so I began to wonder, well, how could that be? How could she not be a little bit worried? Yeah. How could she not have some anxiety that yes. she showed? Yeah, especially and, at that age. Yeah. And so that's that was the beginning of Brianna. Of, of her. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, that's just one of the, the themes that she runs through here. Um, Kirsten has a weight problem. Mm hmm and uh, her mother is not dealing with that well. Mm -hmm. Mother's not dealing with a whole lot of things well. And the parents are fighting, mm -hmm. but um, there's another main character in this book named Walker Jones. Mm -hmm. And he's one of the, I think, three African-American kids in the school. Mm -hmm. And his mother has her own issues, mm -hmm. her own concerns. And I've read that you wanted kids to think about class differences, socioeconomic probably differences, and racism at the same time as you were writing this. Mm -hmm. That was a lot to take on. I know. I know. It was, it was a big challenge. I mean, you did a great job with it. But um, you've got Jamal, and Jamal is a cousin to Walker. And I have to confess that when the suitcase opened, I was not expecting to see in the suitcase what was in the suitcase. She is the master of surprise. I need to warn you that right now. Um, so that was really awesome. That was really great. Well, Jamal actually came out of a school visit uh, really? because I was doing a school visit, and at that school, <laughs> they didn't only two kids from each class who come to the library to hear me, uh -huh. and so they they wow. gave tickets. I know it was too bad. I don't know why it, was, it wasn't my choice. I yeah. don't know why they decided it that way. So this one kid happened to get the ticket, and he realized it was valuable, so he sold it. <laughs> It. Do you know? I don't know. I don't know. Probably not that much. <laughs> so I was asking the teacher about it. And he, she said, oh, that kid would sell the shoes off your feet. Oh, you know? wow. And so that was the beginning of Jamal. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Well, um, Walk's mom worries that he's going to go the wrong way. But life is about to take a huge right turn for both Kirsten and Walker. Mm -hmm. And that's a pretty amazing thing that you did there. So we won't give that away. But you have a brand new book. And I've got an advanced reader copy here. And actually, let's get this because that's much prettier. This is the hardcover. No passengers beyond this point. And you were talking before about the white courtesy phone mm -hmm. and the traveling. Mm -hmm. So this came to you from your traveling? Again, it's hard to know where this came from. Mm -hmm. uh, m my first novel that was unpublished, thank God, <laughs> <laughs> was a fantasy novel. So ah. I think I've always had sort of the desire. I know I have. I've uh -huh. had the desire to write a fantasy novel. But I would come up with these ideas, and I think, eh, I don't know. No. Oh. That's just not going to work. It seems kind of lame. And, yeah. and so I think I, I would say to myself, you know, that's just not who you are. You're not a fantasy novelist. Yeah. So just give it a rest. Yeah. But then I came up with these three characters, this family, and uh, I wasn't quite sure. I, I had them in a plot that wasn't working. Mm -hmm. 
And I was sort of in between things. I was supposed to be working on the third Al Capone book, but I like to ha take a break in between because I love Alcatraz, but mm. I don't want to get tired of it. Yeah. Because oh, um, yeah. that fresh kind of voice has to be real. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, you know, I'm just going to, no one has to know if I could just try. <laughs> I'm just going to try with these characters, see what happens. Yeah. And so often I'll have an outline and then I go back and forth between the outline and the characters take over and back and forth. This one, I just had the characters and I just started and pretty soon I was done. Wow. It was weird. I have no idea where it came from. Wow. I mean, I was doing a lot of traveling at that point mm -hmm. to promote the Al Capone book. Mm -hmm. So I think traveling was a, a big part of my reality. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. Mm -hmm. Well, to set the scene for you all, you've got a family and the dad has passed away, but mom has just lost the house. And she's going to have to send the kids to live with Uncle Red in Denver, Colorado. And she's going to go live with, I think, her brother. So they're not going to be together. And this is incredibly difficult for this, this family. But the kids board the plane, squabble, squabble, squabble. And you've got um, India, the older sister, about 14. Finn, who's very moose-like, if you ask me. Yes. And then yes. Mouse, who is a character that you don't want to miss. And uh, there they are on the plane, and, you know, they're going along, and then it gets super turbulent and bumpy. And the plane lands, and there they are at the airport, and they've got one of those guys with the sign, you know, that says the, what's their last name? Tompkins. The Tompkins. So the Tompkins. So, you know, the kids go, they follow, and they get in this incredible vehicle. And they are about to set off on a journey to go to Uncle Red, but also like three personal journeys, which I can't even begin to describe to you what she has created here. Now, we said a few minutes ago that you are the master of surprise. I will not give away this amazing ending. Um, but what kind of reaction are you getting from kids? Well, I get all kinds of reaction to this uh, ending. I mean, some people just absolutely love it. Yeah. Some people are just so shocked and surprised that they you know, find it they difficult. Take it in. Most people that go back to the beginning see that I really, I, I thought it was very obvious. I did not think it was going to be a surprise to anyone. And wow. I was so surprised when my editor said she didn't know. Because wow. I felt I left so many clues yeah. that it would be clear. Yes. But it wasn't. Huh. Um, so some people will get it, but my goal was to write it so that it would be fun either way. Yeah. If you were picking up all the clues yeah. or if you weren't, yep. that it would still be a fun book. Yeah. So that, that oh, was it's the a, challenge. It's a great fun book. It's a great <laughs> fun book. And following the three kids, I mean, it's kind of like a little bit they get a chance, especially India, to look at her life and really see the truth of it. Mm -hmm. Really see the truth of it. But this is a little of Dorothy. And, and Oz and, you know, there's no place like home. And uh, so that's no passengers beyond this point. Well, thank you so much for coming today. It has been such a treat to sit and talk to you. And you all can see the, the incredible range of books. And these are, these are books kids love to read. These are books that we don't have to, you know, make them, take them. They, they come in looking for them. So if, you're, if your kids are young, we've got the picture books. If they're running to about, oh, I'd say 9, 10, 11, just send them on in. If I have a copy, they can have it. If not, we can always put a request on it. So please, thanks for joining us and come see us at the library. Thank you very much, Barb. This has Thank been fabulous. You. Thank you so much.